show it's been a little bit of a journey to get to do it I uh, started I was living in London and look I, I like living in London and I've practiced saying that with a straight face <laughs> I don't know the way I feel about London is uh, I smoke in London I don't smoke in any other city don't smoke anywhere else okay because I want to live a long and healthy life and uh, in London, I smoke. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where I smoke. It's also, it's pretty good because the air pollution is so bad, at least with a cigarette, you got a filter. <laughs> so you should smoke in London, really. You should smoke there. But I was, I was living there in London and I left my flat on tour for six weeks uh, in March 2020. And I am still technically on that tour <laughs> three years later. Turns out, not the best time to be getting on a plane. <laughs> I was living in London. My landlord in London packed up my flat uh, via Zoom. Can you imagine how demeaning that is? How <laughs> invasive? Your landlord, some grubby scumbag you don't even know, going around all of your objects, going through every single item in your house, every book, every piece of paper rummaging around, holding everything up to the camera one by one, going, do you want these? They've got stains. <laughs> and like, yeah, nah, Terry, you can keep those. So I know you've had your eye on them, but I would like the purple dildo, mailed express, all right? <laughs> With tracking, because I don't trust you, Terry. <laughs> I don't trust you. I find it funny being in the UK uh, because all my ancestors are British. I meant, I'm British. I'm meant to be British, but all of my uh, ancestors got a little bit too into murdering in the late 17th century, so they were all shipped here to the sunny place. All the murderers fucked. They made me. And now I pop back to do their arts festivals. You know? <laughs> like, my, it is true. My, my great, great, great whatever grandfather, he was deported for murder, uh, battery, Theft of two hats. <laughs> and, uh, I love it. I love it. Basically, the best part of that is underneath, in tiny little letters, it says, uh, listed in order of severity. <laughs> Very thorough record keeping back in the day. It's a lot of art. And I, you know, I like being there. What was, what was meant to happen was I was meant to uh, leave London, go to Cape Town uh, for the Cape Town Comedy Festival, and then I was meant to come to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. What happened instead was I was rerouted over Australia uh, to New Zealand, where my husband had already gone ahead. And I know, look, some of you are looking at me a little bit surprised to find out that I am married to a man. Uh, <laughs> if, if that's you, well, you wouldn't believe the shock he got, yeah. all right? <laughs> Still recovering. <laughs> It was so intense, you know, not, not the worst day of my life, but the, the most intense, you know, the most stressful, just sprinting through the airport, real Indiana Jones stuff. I made it to New Zealand with 30 minutes before they closed the border, and no one knew. I didn't know what was going to happen, you know? No one knew what was happening with the pandemic. I didn't know what would happen if I got to New Zealand, if I made it, if I didn't make it. Turns out what happens if you make it to New Zealand in a pandemic is New Zealand does not let you out again uh, for quite some time. <laughs> and I know, so privileged. What a wonderful, safe place to be in the pandemic. I know, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jacinda, for keeping me safe. Thank you, New Zealand, for keeping me safe. Uh, thank you so much. But I would maybe like to point out uh, that I don't live in New Zealand. <laughs> I, I don't live there. I don't have a house. Uh, I don't have a job. I don't have much to do, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> New Zealand holding you, mm, being detained in New Zealand. <laughs> mm. No, you can't laugh, you have to go, yeah, uh, good fixing. Um, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> being detained in New Zealand <laughs> for your own safety during a pandemic is a little bit like being sat on by a Saint Bernard. <laughs> like, it's very sweet, it only wants what's best for you, but it's a chunk out of your day, you know? <laughs> like, it was like 12 months or so before the borders opened. So I uh, lived in the woods. Uh, I lived in the woods and that 
uh, changes a person. <laughs> Everyone looked at you like, what do you mean you lived in the woods? What do you mean? Well, technically, I lived at my mother-in-law's house, or I lived at, in my mother-in-law's house, but it's only a one bedroom. We just went there straight from the airport, packed in, and, you know, there's a, there was a couch and one bedroom sort of packed into this little house, and, and then, you know, my mother-in-law coped with lockdown by watching murder mysteries on the television. My husband played video games in the bedroom because everyone copes in their own way, and I didn't. <laughs> I fucked off to the woods. <laughs> I fucked off to the woods and, you know, it was fine. I went out. Everyone got a little backpack. I was like, I'm going to the woods. I'm going to go live in the woods. And they didn't stop me, which, you know, at the time, I was very relieved. In hindsight, it's a little bit insulting. <laughs> not, not even like, oh, are you all right living in the woods? <laughs> no, no, off you go. We'll pack your bags. <laughs> Yeah, again, you go, well, what do you mean, living in the woods? Well, normal living in the woods stuff, all right? You know, I was, uh, I was bathing in the streams, uh, I was squirreling tins, uh, napping amongst the ferns, roaming around like a creature, uh, washing my clothes in another stream. Very important to split your streams, all right? <laughs> you know, also, if you want to imagine me in the woods, which you should, you know, you've paid your money, uh, if you want to <laughs> imagine me in the woods, uh, please note one thing, that I didn't take a lot of clothes with me uh, to New Zealand uh, because I was going to South Africa. I was like, oh, it's going to be quite warm and then New Zealand's quite cold. Uh, so my mother-in-law rummaged through the garage to sort of find some of my husband's old clothes for me to wear. Uh, so if you imagine me in the woods, please imagine me dressed like a Samoan teenager going clubbing in 2003. <laughs> Which in New Zealand was still 1991. <laughs> and I really, I really told myself that I, that I liked the woods, that I, that I liked being out there. But when I think about it, really deep down, I think I felt ashamed. You know, I felt a bit embarrassed at what had happened to me, that I'd sort of found myself in this situation where I didn't have my own house, I didn't have my own, you know, I didn't have any money, I'd lost my job, everything was sort of out of my control, and I just felt a bit embarrassed, you know, because what had happened to me was what everyone always told me would happen to me if I went into the arts, <laughs> you know? I was warned. <laughs> Like, oh, Laura, if you go into the arts, you're going to end up homeless, living in the woods, burying tins of baked beans, bathing in a stream. <laughs> and I uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to be famous. Turns out they were right, all right? <laughs> they didn't... No one could have predicted the green leather blazer, but, you know... <laughs> they were pretty close. <laughs> and every single time, you know, in the papers, uh, the thing that sort of... Uh, really broke it for me. It was a newspaper article and a big headline on the front talking about arts funding during the pandemic and it said, uh, the arts is a luxury we can't afford. Brutal, right? And I felt a bit embarrassed about that and I wanted to, to fight that in myself. And I thought, well, I'm going to still, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my show in the woods. And so I went out into the woods at night, got swiped my neighbour's solar torch, you know, they were in bed, took that out with me. I went out into the woods at night because even in my imagination, only weirdos come to comedy in the day, OK? <laughs> so, so we went out at night. And I went up the little dirt trail to the top of the hill and I got a log. <laughs> I stood on the log sort of in the middle of the hollering dark and I started writing this show and I started putting it together and I was like, I'm going to rehearse, I'm going to go out every night, I'm going to rehearse a show on the log, I'm going to get it right. But the thing is, if you put a light on yourself in the woods at night, you get covered in bugs. <laughs> you know? And I thought I'd get smart, I'd get a second light, I'd put it over there, and that way it would halve the bugs. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Turns out doubles the bugs. <laughs> and again, not the, not the worst moment of my life, but probably one of the most symbolic, one of the most metaphoric. When I looked around, sort of eyes wide, going, well, I think it is too dark to put a light on. <laughs> Bleak, right? That's the bleakest. And all the comments sort of in the newspapers, all, all, the, all the online stuff about the arts, all the people sort of slamming the arts furiously, you know, and all that sort of stuff of like, oh, well, the arts are the luxury we can't afford. Oh, oh well, we don't, shouldn't fund the artists because, well, what, they just think they're special. What makes them so special? We shouldn't fund the arts because, oh, what can I get arts funny? I'll shit on the canvas and I'll call it art. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> 
don't know. This is this is the show, by the way. It's here. Uh, this is that's the first half. That's the second. I've still got it. Uh, on the inside, it just says, "You're doing great." <laughs> and now that is really just for me. All right. <laughs> but if you need it, you let me know. All right. <laughs> I'm here for you. Yeah. This is it. This is the show. And yeah, I love this show, I really do. Uh, but I think we've all had enough therapy since 2020 to know that you can love things and still think they need to change. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I did write some of this a little bit earlier, you know. Some of this is from 2019. Like, there's a joke here about the time that I vomited on a dolphin. Like, <laughs> there's a joke about the time uh, that I found out that I'm strong enough to lift a man up and suck his cock against a wall. <laughs> And they're good jokes, they're very fun, but they're not for current times, are they? <laughs> feel a bit luxurious, there's a war on, come on. I don't know, I feel nervous every single time that I make a, start making a piece of work, because I see it every festival now, I see it all the time. They drag some poor fucking artist out of the program guide and they throw him in the court of public opinion. They start pointing the finger, you know, just like, oh, this artist, they were incredible. They were so funny, they were hilarious, I laughed, I cried. Uh, but they didn't say anything about global warming, you know? They were so funny, they were incredible. They are very uh, enjoyable performance. And I forgave my father his alcoholism and finally got the courage to find help for my own. But he didn't say anything about racism or Black Lives Mattering, or the militarization of police or feminism, or the microplastics in the ocean, or endangered species of heirloom tomatoes. He didn't say anything. I was going to give him five stars, but he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. <laughs> Leave him alone. He's a mine. <laughs> and I love it. I love telling that joke. <laughs> I love telling that joke because everyone panics at a different point. <laughs> some people go early, some stay and defend. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. I've got like 70 people in front of me, each with a slightly different facial expression. <laughs> love it. So that thing of everyone's got a different idea of, you know, what the most important thing to talk about in a comedy show is, you know, because everyone wants it to be funny. You know, always want it to be funny, but they also now, they want it to be uh, political. They want it to be cathartic. They want it to be uplifting, you know, and important. But everyone's got a different idea of what the most important thing that I could talk about is. And I can't talk about two things at once. I talk pretty fast, but I can't double up all the time. <laughs> You know, I do a lot of feminist material and then people say, oh, well, maybe you need to do more men's jokes. If you talked about men's issues a bit more, maybe you'd be on the television, you know? Maybe you'd be more of a humanist comedian, just a feminist comedian, and maybe do some jokes about men's mental health, important topics like that. So it looks like you don't care about men, and that's not fair. I do. I love men, okay? I care about men so much. I am passionate about men's mental health. Every single time I walk home at night, I see a man, the first thing I think is, is this motherfucker crazy? All right, first thing. <laughs> Top of the noggin. I can tell you if a man has a good relationship with his mother at a distance in the dark, okay? <laughs> Stressful. <laughs> I didn't start out as a political comedian. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be a political comedian. I started when I was 19 and, oh my God, you wouldn't believe how cute I was. <laughs> so cute, little, little dress, little cardigan, you know, fringe doing quite a lot of heavy lifting for the personality I'd yet to develop. <laughs> so cute, unbelievably cute. And, you know, I did my first show at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival uh, was in 2010, my first hour, and it was called Ants Don't Sleep. Oh. It was an hour on, on animal facts, cute little animal facts, because that's sort of what I wanted to talk about, all of the incredible animals and everything. And, and, and a little, like some of the jokes, not too bad. Some are in there, you know, some of them, not half, you know, a little bit of promise. I'll like, see, see if I can get her for you. She's sort of, she's quite, she's still in there. The industry killed her quite a long time ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> That, that's a joke, all right. <laughs> the industry didn't kill her, I did. Um. <laughs> See, she's quite high on the mic, quite, quite high. Um, oh, quite, 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 
quite bouncy, you know, big eyes, little cardigan, little bow in my hair, little jokes like this. Um, I just want to, uh, hey, yeah, here she is. Uh, uh, cows, uh, cows can walk upstairs, uh, but they can't walk downstairs again. It's, it's just the way the knees go. Um, so, so basically, I think what that means is if you uh, go upstairs in your house and you find a cow, uh, it's best just to get used to it. <laughs> Cute, right? I miss her, right? I miss her sometimes. <laughs> I miss her. Oh, I didn't mean to be a political comedian, but I bought the blazer and it suits me, so... <laughs> and I don't know if it's because uh, the world has changed or I've changed or what people want to talk about is different. You know, what feels important is different, but I can't do a show about animals and animal facts anymore. You know, somehow it's turned out that it is my job over the next 45 minutes uh, in a funny way to tell you uh, that the Antarctic is experiencing a heat wave. <laughs> there you go, laugh it up, cunts. Let's be done with it. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know how to do that in a political way, in an uplifting, cathartic way. I don't know. I'm not a trained science communicator, all right? I know quite a lot about the oceans, but that's because I got a weird thing where I watch an ocean documentary like every day. Like, I. Don't look at me. I said weird thing, all right? I said weird thing. I know it's weird. I know it's not normal. Basically, someone showed me a documentary about the oceans when I was about six years old. I watched it. I went, that is the best fucking thing I have ever seen in my life. I'm never watching anything else, and I've pretty much stuck to it. Right? <laughs> One ex-boyfriend tried to make me watch Die Hard. I hated every fishless fucking minute of it. <laughs> If you weren't here, which according to pre-sales, you weren't gonna be, I, I would be home on the couch in snacks uh, with the Blue Planet 2 on the projector, pulling up my shirt and letting the fish swim on my tummy, okay? That, that's who you're talking to me. I love the oceans. I am obsessed with the majesty of the deep. I am I'm besotted with the wonders of the waves, all right? I love it. Uh, I'm too scared to swim in them because I'm from Western Australia where they're full of reasons. Uh, but <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And everything I know about climate change, I know from these documentaries. Like, I know Blue Planet 1 came out in 2001, episode 4, Frozen Seas. The whole gist of that episode is look at these polar bears. Look at them. They're so sad and uh, so hungry because there is so much ice in Antarctica. They can't get around all the ice to get to the food. It's so cold and, and frozen. Uh, cut to Blue Planet uh, 2, you know? Look at all these polar bears. They're so sad and starving because there's absolutely no ice in Antarctica. It's all gone. Uh, no ice in Antarctica. Poor polar, they're all hot and sweaty. <laughs> Turns out it was a good year to be a polar bear in about 2011 and no other times. So that, that was it. It was a good year to be a polar bear, shit year to be Osama Bin Laden or Charlie Sheen. That was it. <laughs> it's just the way it works. <laughs> I don't really know how to tell people about climate change, you know, in a fun way, in a, in a funny way. I don't know how to convince them uh, that it's real. I was in a sauna in London, which is already quite rare for me. I don't like to go in a sauna. If you find me in a sauna, it's a bit like finding a walrus in the jungle, all right? Something's happened, all right? There's a story there, okay? I don't like a sauna because a sauna is just a little room where I am alone with my thoughts. And I don't like being alone with my thoughts. That's why you're here, okay? <laughs> I don't like it. So people think that because I'm a comedian, I must spend a lot of time in my head. You know, I'm, I'm like this all the time. I must spend a lot of time in my own thought. No, no, no. I stay the fuck out of there. Thank you. Because that's where I keep all the stuff that I know that I know that I don't want to know. You know. That's all up there. Things like the memory of my first grade teacher uh, telling me that dolphins weren't real. They were fictional. <laughs> Fucking broke my heart. <laughs> or uh, the knowledge that my own potential is just a myth sold to me by vitamin companies? Uh, no. No lingering in the old noggin for me. Right. Those in the sauna do my best job to be in the sauna, out of my head. You know, in the sauna, out of my head. In the sauna, 
out of my head. And a man came in and sat down right next to me, which is uh, legal. All right, feels, <laughs> feels like it shouldn't be. It's, and I realised in that moment that I don't know sauna etiquette at all, because I'm from Western Australia. We don't have saunas, we just have outside. <laughs> I didn't know if I should say hello to him, basically. I didn't know if I should greet him. Is it too much to sort of go, oh, well, uh, hello, I'm Laura. Uh, welcome to the sauna. I'll be your sauna mate. Like, that's too much. You can't do that. I don't want to ignore him. He might feel unwanted. Uh, you know, feeling unwanted is one of the worst feelings a person can feel. Uh, so I thought I'll just say it in a way that he knows he can answer if he wants to, but he doesn't have to answer if he doesn't want to. Uh, and I'll just sort of say, you know, like, hey, how are you going? He can say, look, oh, I'm all right, but you're like, mm, or whatever he wants. I'll just say it. And I was like, hey, how are you? And he jumped straight in, <laughs> straight, straight in. He went, uh, oh, no good, actually. Uh, I'm just here uh, to cleanse myself of all the chemtrails. It was a big day in London, <laughs> come to cleanse my lungs from all the chemtrails in London today. And I said, oh, sir, good news, uh, chemtrails aren't real. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to worry about them. <laughs> and he said, uh, yes, they are, and global warming isn't real, but it's just the chemtrails, and when uh, the chemtrails are gone, we'll be able to solve global warming, because global warming isn't real, uh, but chemtrails are. And I said, sir, I think I completely agree with you, uh, except I think it might be just the other way around, where uh, global warming is real and chemtrails aren't real. <laughs> And he said, uh, yes, they are. And I said, uh, no, they're not. And he said, oh, it should be the way I say it. <clears throat> he said, uh, no, this is me. This is him. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. And he said, uh, no, it's not. And I said, yes, this is all a summary, by the way. <laughs> he said, no, it's not. Like, yes, it is. Until I realised it was not going to be a case of who was right or who was wrong, uh, but who could stay in the sauna longer. <laughs> and if that's not a metaphor for climate change, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what is. <laughs> they always tell you, uh, don't get in the mud with pigs. I would like to add, don't get in an oven with a fruitcake. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a metaphor for global warming, not if you don't want it to be. Metaphor is an incredibly flexible tool of language. That's the beauty of it! <laughs> yeah. You know, to me, that is a story about two people in a box having a heated, no pun, <laughs> argument about what's outside the box. And if that, look, that might not be a metaphor for global warming, but it could be a metaphor for fucking everything else <laughs> at the point. Because it really feels like we've started to sort of splinter our realities. We're really starting to divide in terms of consensus. I don't know, it just feels like there used to be a little bit more consensus on what was real and what was chemtrails, you know? <laughs> People I've known a long time are starting to come to me with, with a very different perception of what's outside the box. And, you know, you can blame uh, capitalism, you can blame the internet. I like to blame capitalism on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the Venn diagram of where it's the most uh, productive and effective to sort of divide people, you know? I think because my surname is Davis, I keep getting this ad on Instagram for this absolutely deranged fucking T-shirt. You know, it's a black T-shirt, white writing, big letters that just says, it's a David thing. <laughs> you wouldn't understand. <laughs> Is that what we're doing now? We're dividing the world up into Davids and not... David's? <laughs> where, 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 where are the lines? Am I right? Imagine. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> <clears throat> there are two rules of the internet, they tell us. Rule number one, don't click the clickbait. Rule number two, don't read the comments. But that's all the internet is. That's all that's on there. It's a whole thing, you know, all the clickbait, all the classic ones, all those classic little lines, you know, the fun ones, they were fun. You know, those ones like, uh, the, this woman was in a coma for 30 years until uh, the cleaner walked past playing tub thumping by Chumba Wamba. <laughs> click the watch the moment, she gets up and starts singing the chorus and she gets thumped down, knocked down, but she gets up again, click, absolutely click. I fucking want to watch Chumba Wamba reunite a family. <laughs> click, click. <laughs> Better. Better. Or 
late. Everyone ran from this swarm of bees, but this guy gave him a job working at his bakery in Leeds. So now <laughs> they're CEO, or should we say BEO, of their own bread company called Beastie Yeasty. Click for 15 percent. Click! I don't even care if it's true. You know, how could you possibly care if it's true? Anyone who says that they don't want to escape reality right now is fucking out of touch with it, all right? It, it's not good out here. We've overfished the oceans. We're putting rubbish in the oceans, you know? The only fish that are doing well are those little sushi soy sauce fish, and they're outnumbering us like a billion to one. <laughs> fucking thriving. All of those things. I don't care if it's true. How could you possibly care if it's true? You know, you don't want to be here in reality, stuck in this yuck club. Yeah, no way. You want a whiff of the grifty spliff, don't you? <laughs> you want your eyes on the lines. You want some fake news you can use, you know? You want to be on your back in the dark, even head to the hydra, a flickering shift of infinite limbo on LCD ecstasy. Come on. <laughs> oh, you don't want to be there. You could spend your entire life, you could spend an entire human lifetime just reading the last 24 hours of internet comments. Just what's there, you know? People think that the internet comments is this myopic conga line of angry, angry people, you know? But, but they're not, uh, you know? One, because again, I think we've all had enough therapy since 2020 to know that angry people are just scared people, you know? They're just sad people, you know? Anger is just fear with its, you know, boots on. <laughs> That's all it is, <laughs> yeah? And two, uh, there's actually a lot of structure to it, a lot of structure to the comments. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a structure guy, I'm in there, you know, and, and it's always the same, people think it's chaos, it's not. Comment number one, always this, comment number one is always, um, <clears throat> well, this blew up. <laughs> Would you like to buy a sunset lamp? <laughs> cute, right, cute. Mm -hmm. Comment number two is always this one, comment number two is always, uh, well, those sunset lamps are made by Taiwanese orphans in Taiwan, and you're a fucking cunt for trying to sell those sunset lamps so they're non-biodegradable, they clog up the oceans. You're a piece of shit for trying to sell those. And comment number three is always, well, I am a teenager in Norway, and I have seasonal affective depression. That sunset lamps are the only reason I didn't kill myself last winter. <laughs> Wait, you're saying you don't give a fuck about Norwegian teens with mental health. Comment number four is always, well, I have seasonal affective depression, and I cured it by buying one of these crystals. Would you like to buy one of these crystals? <laughs> And comment number five is always, well, I don't buy one of those crystals. I bought one of those crystals and we had the worst year of our lives. The dog died, the house burned down, my husband lost his job. And the next comment is, well, I have a job your husband can do where he earns $5,000 a week. What the <laughs> home? <laughs> Just there, just scrolling in the deep, you know? Just scrolling down, 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 going down into the depths through fathoms of weightless opinion like some dark Cousteau right down to the bottom in the deep little comment there at the bottom looking up at all the other comments out of time, out of space, out of context. Little comment, Garogan peering up at the depths, tiny little comment with his eyes trembling in the dark. Little comment, little comment raising his little comment voice going, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, 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 uh. Why do I crave hamburgers, lol? <laughs> and then looming out of the digital gloom, bigger, mwah, bigger comment, mwah. Oh, you might be low on vitamin B12 and or iron. Would you like to buy some of these iron supplements? <laughs> Terrifying. What are we doing? Just gazing at the abyss. Just gaze at the abyss, just gaze at the abyss, let the abyss gaze back into you. Take a moment, if you can, to rate the abyss, because the abyss really values customer feedback and would love to know what you thought of your abyss experience. And Jenny writes, I gazed at the abyss, and the abyss gazed straight back into me. Great service from the abyss would gaze again. <laughs> Jackson, right? I'm usually more of a screaming into the void kind of a guy, but I gazed at this abyss for my birthday and I loved it. Thanks, Sarah. Love you, Sarah. What are you doing? Nah, we did it. We did all that. Now, you guys are nailing this. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can you can all breathe too now. Like I can't breathe doing that bit. Uh, but you are welcome to help yourself to the available oxygen in the room. Okay, I, I don't know what it is. People sort of <gasps> gasp and say, you, you go for it. All right, I'm I'm up here. <laughs> too many and I know. I know there are so many words in this show. It is a dense show. It is a big show. It is two shows packed into one show, doubled in, because I've been doing this long enough to know that I only get half the credit for what I put in. So I try and double the effort, uh, break even. All right? That's, <laughs> that's how it has to work, you know? I put a bit of poetic language in it so people know I wrote it. You know, that's, that's all that's for. It's in there so people don't go, a woman having a mental breakdown every day at exactly the same time. <laughs> Somehow it all comes together in the end. <laughs> so disappointing. <laughs> Most of the reviews for this show said something along the lines of crazy angry woods woman hates the world. <laughs> but I, don't, I don't think it's an angry show. I don't, I don't think that it is. I, I think if I was a male comedian, they would find other words, you know, I, I'd be a glittering wit or, you know, I, I'd be acerbic or I'd be something, yeah, anything, yeah, anything but that. But I'm not a male comic and, and I can't uh, spend any more time wishing that I was. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I did, I, I'm very guilty at the start of my career. I really wished, I wished that I was a male comedian. It just looked so much easier. I, you know, it, it, it got paid more, it looked better. And I, I, I was right, you know, it was, it's not. Like a grass is greener situation. You picture me, 19, going out to the gold fields in Western Australia in my little cardigan, going out there in front of all the miners for the mining tours, going like, um, <coughs> uh, cows can walk upstairs. It's okay to laugh. It's all right to laugh, all right? I got through it. It's okay to laugh. Cows can walk upstairs. It's no good. No good. But I, I wouldn't want to do it now. I wouldn't be a male comedian for anything, you know, because of the way that the world has gone, the, the cancel culture is a big problem, according to every cab driver uh, who's <laughs> told me about it. You know, I wouldn't do it. It's too high risk, these male comedians, you know. They're, they're all there, nervous, fettered on eggshells, you know. They're too scared to say what they want to say. They're too nervous to do what they want to do. Some of them can't even masturbate in front of a colleague anymore. And... <laughs> And look, for a lot of them, that was really where the love was. In the <laughs> sure, the craft went into the material, but the passion was in the hands, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I genuinely, I couldn't be a male comedian. It's too much pressure. I, I, I couldn't do it, you know? Yeah, they're all so nervous, just, you know, get all your dick out and your whole career is over. Do you know how many colleagues I've masturbated in front of? Like nine. It has never hurt my career, okay? <laughs> it didn't help it, as I was told that it would, but... <laughs> I try, like, don't look at me like always consensual, all right? Always consensual, no, no green room stuff, always, always consensual, always at home, in private, once in a park. We're all young once, all right? <laughs> Pull up your dogs. I couldn't, I couldn't. And, and the reason that I couldn't is because this job is heartbreaking. You put all your hopes into it, you put all your effort into it, it can come crumbling down. I lived in the woods, it is unstable. And if I could quit, I would quit, okay? I've tried, I can't. I can't quit, I'm too stubborn to quit. My mama didn't raise no quitter, but maybe she raised a backstage sex pest, all right? <laughs> like, <look. laughs> if I just know if I could do that, if I just whip my dick out and have it all be over, I would, all right? I would. <laughs> I know that I would, but I can't. Like, I, I can't, you know? I can't whip my dick out and have my career get cancelled, you know? I can't, I can't get my dick out and, and be cancelled. Uh, one, because my landlord still has mine. Um, <laughs> and two, I've got a very differently policed body, you know? I could do this whole show with my pants around my ankles and it wouldn't be uh, something you, I got cancelled over. It wouldn't be offensive. It would, it would be very brave when I would get arts funding, all right? <laughs> I know. I know. The only thing I think is like I, I could do is like a nipple 
Maybe, like, I, I know uh, for, for live shows, if there's a nipple, uh, a, you know, a female nipple in a show, uh, then you have to sort of have, like, you, you have to be warned. You would have had to be warned. You would have had to have a heads up on the nipple. You would have, like, sign a little waiver on the way in, do, like, a, a secret nipple handshake to show your hips to the nip. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, uh, which is why I've sort of got this system in place. Um, <laughs> Like, this is here for all our safety, okay? Because <laughs> I can't be trusted. I look at this, oh, you're filming the special fucking go! <laughs> it's over! <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You did do quite well with that, though. <laughs> I, hear. I was programmed at 4 p.m. in Edinburgh, which I did try to warn them was a mistake. Um, <laughs> And they're like, it'll be fine. I'm like, sure, it's not going to be weird for me to have my tit out in front of strangers while the post office is still open. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fine, you know, there's nothing to write home about, but you could. The post office was still open. <laughs> I never know how an audience is going to take it. I did a show and a man sort of at the back, sort of that way, uh, just screamed out, No! <laughs> and I was like, Sir, are you all right? Like, it's just a boob, you know? It's just mummy being silly. It's all right, it's just a boob. You know, it's just a boob, it's okay. It's just, it's just a boob. And he was like, oh, sorry. Sorry for screaming, No! Uh, I just want to say, doesn't the tape hurt to take your nipple off? Like, when you take it off, doesn't it hurt your nipple? How did men ever go to war? Um, <laughs> how did they do it? <laughs> how did they do it? <laughs> it's always this tit uh, that I use. This is, this is the business tit. Uh, <laughs> this, one, this one's working. Uh, this one is too good. No, it's not. I'm not being stingy. It's not too good for you. It's just it's not funny. Uh, <laughs> Like this one, this one will still look you in the eye. This one looks like it's got bad news. And it... <laughs> this one looks like it's got bad news and it doesn't know how to tell you. Like... <laughs> this one looks like I made it do this tonight because, because it owed me money. <laughs> it's nice I only have to do it one night, you know, for this. Doing it for a month takes a bit of a toll, you know? <laughs> Yeah, at the end of the festival, you know how, like, sometimes the eye on a teddy bear will come a little bit loose? Like... <laughs> and look, I know comedy's not art, you know, I know it's not really eligible for arts funding, but surely this is ready for something, you know? <laughs> surely this is eligible for something. Like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do the hard art like this, like I'm... <clears throat> My father. My father. My father. to put it away. We can't, um, we can't, we can't have a silly show about a boob. We've got to have, like, a political, cathartic, uplifting show. That's what we've got to have. And look, political, yeah, absolutely. We've got to have the tape, that's law. We've got to have the tape, you know, political, um, cathartic for me. After, like, like, 15 years of audiences being like, show us your tits! <laughs> to do it on my own terms, or, and no one even likes it. Mm. <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> Does feel like uplifting might be a bit much to ask this late in the game, but... <laughs> Usually we don't put it back in. Like, uh, I did consider it quite a few Edinburgh. Like, basically, if I thought the audience were a bunch of cunts, it stays out. Uh... <laughs> uh, if you bought your nan, it stays out. Like, <laughs> good for him. All right, we'll put it away. Um, we can put it away. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Yeah. No, it's, it's because it's quite hard to put it away. Uh, usually, I do just leave one, like, half up, half down. Uh, <laughs> you know, sort of like a, like a wedding hairstyle. <laughs> like, a, like a mullet or something. Uh, we can't. We can't have a silly show about a boob. But I, I also I don't like when people say, oh, it's very smart comedy. You know, that was a bit lowbrow. The boob bit was a bit lowbrow. I thought you did smart comedy for smart people. Mm -hmm. Smart comedy for smart or uh, smart comedy for smart people. A smart audience. If you're a smart audience, you will really like Laura. She's very smart comedy for smart. Smart people will like it. Yes, yeah, you're smart. How smart are you? You will like it. Ah, oh, don't do that. All right, I don't like it at all. Don't congratulate yourselves for being smart. Don't be smug about being smart. Be grateful, all right? Because we have made it hard to get smart. My teacher didn't think dolphins were real, all right? <laughs> We've made it hard to get smart. We have gutted our education system. We have gutted the arts industry. And the arts is an education. It's the original education. It's what we used to have before we had anything else, you know? Uh, the arts is an uh, education that shows you who you are in the context of the people around you in the time and place that you're in. It's what we had before we had anything else. The arts is there so that you don't buy a T-shirt that says it's a David thing you wouldn't understand. <laughs> because actually, you saw Michelangelo's statue of David and that guy had a little dick as well, you know? <laughs> And even if you get smart, if you manage it, if you manage to get smart, it's not nice to be smart. We're not making it pleasant. You don't want to be smart. You don't want to know that the system was so stacked against you uh, that you never stood a fucking chance, you know? And the Oxfords have had their brogues on your throat since the moment you were born. You want to think the problem is immigrants, <laughs> OK? That's all right. I'm not saying that's the right thing to think. Okay? I'm saying I can see why people might want to think that. You know, it's easier. It feels like you can do something about it. Like, you don't want to know that you have a personality disorder caused by childhood trauma and you're self-sabotaging all your relationships. You want to think you're a Capricorn. <laughs> it's nicer. It's nicer. Ignorance is bliss. Some of the happiest people I know genuinely believe they're Hufflepuffs, OK? <laughs> I don't even really believe in stupid people. I don't, I, I don't think it makes any sense with how far we've come as a species, you know, all the technological heights we've reached, all the philosophical depths. We're not stupid as a species. We're very smart biologically. I think we're stupid agriculturally. Uh, by which I mean we're currently farming stupid people en masse, because they're worth quite a bit. <laughs> you know? We're sowing the seeds for the future, you know? Because stupid people are easy to scare and scared people are easy to control. And more than anything, scared stupid people buy things, OK? And not just all the pasta and the toilet paper. They only do that when they're very scared, OK? Most of the time, they're just roaming wild from the free market, you know, filling every possible gap in their lives with the infinite Tetris of worthless shit slinging down at all times. You know, my parents have an electric... Pepper grinder. <laughs> what the fuck is that? For? Like, what the fuck? What, what is it? Like, obviously, it has a purpose, it has a use, you know? It's sort of uh, so that instead of going like, uh, like, uh, uh, you get to go. not dumb cunts, all right? <laughs> Just this big, awful thing, a big, chunking thing, like an anti-terror bollard in front of the gravy. What the fuck? <laughs> and this is where we can't make any progress. This is where the left will eat the left. If people tell me to take that joke out of the show because it's actually, actually, it's quite offensive, all right? Actually, it's not very politically correct because, actually, the electric pepper grinders, they're not for dumb cunts. Actually, no, they were invented in 1924 for people who didn't have any arms or any elbows or any fingers or any <laughs> knuckles, and they need an electric pepper grinder. They need an electric pepper grinder so that they can uh, grind the pepper with the chin. I know, all right? I know. I know. Call off your dogs. I know, all right? I know that every invention 
on this planet are all siblings in twain to the great mother of necessity I know. And they jump in with what they think I think before I even get to tell them what I think, you know? They don't care what I really think. They're so busy trying to get angry about it that they jump straight in. But if you ask me what I think, I can tell you what I think. I think if you are born without any arms or you acquire less than you started with at any point in your life, you should get a free electric pepper grinder paid for by the state by taxing companies with a negative social capital. Or I think that. I think that. I just think at the same time in my same head at exactly the same moment. I just think that maybe, 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 maybe we shouldn't have orphans in Africa digging up metal so orphans in China come out millions of the cunting things and they ship them across the world, destroying the oceans in the process, you know, all so some cunts on the high street can go <laughs> I think that, okay? I think that. But it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I think, because that's just the way the world is. You know? Because if you can sell an electric pepper grinder to someone, you can sell uh, anything to anyone. If you can sell anything to anyone, you can sell everything to everyone. If you can sell everything to everyone, you can maybe afford to go to space all by yourself, and maybe that'll make you feel something, you stunted husk of a cunt, all right? <laughs> you know, the void within calls the void without. You know, they, they can't feel it. There's no way, there's no limits. You know, they're off there, they're trying to go to space. We're not going to space. I know, or I know it's a big call, I know. We're not going to space. I know we're not because we invented Uber Eats before we invented space travel. <laughs> so we're not even going to the corner to get our own curry anymore. <laughs> That's not the hallmark of a species destined for space. <laughs> I don't know what to make of the future. I don't know how to think about the future. I don't know what to feel about the future. I'm 35. I would love to have a kid. Oh, mwah. oh I would love a kid. Mwah. Just one, just mwah. one little kid. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I would love to have a kid. Mwah. But having a kid in the 2020s feels a little bit like inviting someone to a party that you know is wrapping up. You know? <laughs> you know? Uh, clearing up the glasses around you, you're on the phone. Yeah, no, nah, man, it's lit. Get an Uber. <laughs> yeah, bring your sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I've found a loophole, though. I think I'm going to have a kid, but I'm going to tell that kid it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> no, that you used to. That used to be a mean thing to say to a kid. Now I think it's the only justifiable excuse. <laughs> <laughs> what am I meant to say? Oh, no, we knew that the world was crumbling around you and it was all going to be quite bad for you, but we thought you might like to do uh, some TikTok dances before it all goes black. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No. I'm going to say the condom broke and I didn't believe in abortion, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Look at me, of course I believe in abortion. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Um, I think maybe, I think the only way to ethically have a kid in this day and age is uh, to have the kid. Like, I, I will have the kid, Mwah, kiss it, love it, Mwah, give it all the memories, you know, take it to the zoo, show it whatever is left of the animals. Mwah, mwah. Give it all the kisses until it's two years old. And then I think the only responsible thing you can do is to take that baby and drop it off at the doorstep of your nearest doomsday church. Whatever faith that is in your neighborhood, all right, just the closest. <laughs> and leave it. And let them raise your kid. All right? Because we don't know how long we got left on this planet. We don't know. You know, how much time we have left, 10 years, 20 years, so it doesn't matter, all right? It just matters that on that day, on that final day, you know, when the rivers have run dry, society has collapsed, you know, I'm screaming in the street. I know I am. I'm screaming in the street, you know, I'm wailing, I'm doing the whole thing. I'm going to be good, all right? I, I got a plan. I got an outfit picked out. Ah, wailing, ah, the sushi soy fish are sort of piling up around us. Ah, the lava's coming down. Ah, on that day, on that final day, that dooms day, my kid, my baby, mwah, the one that I mwah, kissed, mwah, took to the zoo, my kid gets to draw the curtains and look out to a blood red sky 
and gaze out at the suffering and the bloodshed and the anguish and the grief and mic it, mic it, mic it, mic it. Goes to put up his hands and hold up his head and go, Oh, goody, it's here! Yay! <laughs> that is love, okay? That is love. That is love. You cannot tell me that is not love, okay? That is love. <laughs> <clears throat> What am I meant to say? What am I meant to say to this kid? You know, that we knew and we didn't do anything. What am I meant to say? When global warming finally calls cut on this extended edition of humanity, you know, and we say we knew and all these billionaires were in charge and they were destroying everything, we didn't do anything. What are you, what are you just, sorry, I fucking, I always forget what this next bit is. Oh, I think we should kill him. 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 Come on, let's kill him. Come on, let's kill him. 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 Come on. Let's do it. Let's just kill one. All right, let's see if we like it. Let's get our teeth wet. Come on. Come on. We used to kill him all the time. We used to kill him for way less than this. We used to kill a cunt if he had too many hats. Come on, let's kill him. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. Don't look at me like that, all right? I know, I know it's hard to tell if I'm joking. Even I don't know if I'm joking, all right? I usually just wait for the reviews to come out and find out that way. <laughs> well, let's get, don't look at me like that, all right? No, you, you're not complicit, all right? It's just a show, you know? I'm not a double agent. There's none in, all right? There's no billionaires snuck in sitting in the back wall stairs like, oh, I thought I was amongst chums. <laughs> I'm the one going on the watch list, all right? <laughs> it's me. And I don't care. I don't care because I uh, fuck them. Uh, fuck them, fuck them, fuck them, fuck them. Fuck them, 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 fuck their smug destruction, fuck their inexorable excess, fuck their cruelty, fuck their greed. Fuck them. And look, maybe, maybe this is why people keep telling me this is an angry show. <laughs> <sighs> I don't, I don't think it's true. I, I don't think it's an angry show, okay? Because I already told you, if you ever think you're looking at an angry person, you gotta try looking a bit harder. If you've ever looked at a person your entire life, you can tell that I'm not an angry person who hates the world, okay? I'm a scared person who loves it. I'm a, I don't hate people. They just make me sad. And I wish, I wish so much, I wish, I wish this was a fun show about the oceans. I wish that was the show I got to do. I wish it was a fun, happy show about the oceans. That was always my plan. I was going to do Ants Don't Sleep and then Wonders of the Deep, you know? It was a wonderful, fun show. And I could tell you, I could tell you about all the incredible things that are there. I could, because if, if you had never seen a dolphin in your life, you would think that they were imaginary. Of course you would, you know? And there's all these things. There's this, this seahorse, you know, they're so pink and they're purple and they're so intricate and incredible that if you ever saw one, if one ever, ever, they're so incredible, they are so perfect and pink and intricate, if one ever said it believed in you, you'd never doubt yourself again, all right? <laughs> and I smoke weed and watch Blue Planet 2 every night, so one of them did, that's why I'm like this. <laughs> And there's this sea nudibranch. This is, it's called a Spanish dancer. It's sort of red, sort of jelly sort of thing. It floats through the ocean. It's so graceful. It's all pink and where it looks like your pussy went on holiday without you. All right? <laughs> and I wish, I wish, I wish it was that show. I wish it was that show. But I can't do that show. I can't do that show because it would feel insane to do that show. In these it feels insane to talk to you about the wonders of the ocean without mentioning that, by the way, they're also boiling up around us. It feels insane. And even if I did, people say, oh, it's a waste of time. It's a luxury we can't afford. There's no point. I don't believe in that either because I don't think that art is a luxury that we can't afford, OK? I think that is a lie bought and paid for by the same people who say that education is a privilege, right? It doesn't serve us. It serves them, you know? Because education is the enemy of contempt, you know? It is very hard to not give a shit about what happens to the oceans once you know what's really in there. And art is the enemy of sort of uh, poverty and war because it's really hard to kill someone once you know what's really inside a human being, you know? 
I would rather that we had art for no good reason than wars for fucking stupid ones. You know, I would rather that we had someone shit on a canvas and call it art than we shat on an underclass and called it fair, that we went backwards and called it progress, that we all sat on our hands and watched the world blaze like a pudding at Christmas and called it fine. All right, and by the way, Christmas pudding is disgusting. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's a long show, all right, it's a big show. If I am right in any goddamn part of this show, I'm right about that, okay? Christmas pudding, not nice. No, don't look at me like, it is not good, all right? Okay, it's not good. If you can set a cake on fire and it doesn't make it any worse, <laughs> it's a bad cake. <laughs> Saying that the world is too bleak to value arts or the education is like saying it is too dark to put a light on. It is a trick. It is a lie. It is a goddamn joke. And I'm so angry that I nearly took the bait, you know? I felt unwanted. And feeling unwanted is one of the worst feelings a person can feel, you know? But I have been doing this for 15 years and I make no apologies for what I am. I am a live artist. I do not live in the woods. I live here, okay? I don't think I'm special. I think this is. And I think that artists across cultures through history have all lived and fought and worked and died for every privilege that I've had on stage today. Everything I've said, everything I've done would have got me uh, burned at the stake 700 years ago, would have got me put in jail, you know, 70 years ago. I don't know, swear to God, I don't know if I've got another seven before this dismembered zombie democracy finally shuffles towards its natural end and they start throwing us all in the pit, all right? Because I know I'm going in the pit. You can tell I'm going in the pit, all right? Look at me, of course I'm going in the fucking pit, all right? Look, <laughs> look at that, of course I'm going in the pit, all right? I'm tied to the mast, and I know comedy's not art, but there's a fucking reference to the Odyssey in a boob job. I don't know what you want. It's fine. I don't know what you want, okay? It's fine. I don't need it. It's fine, okay? I didn't even want you to notice. It's fine, I didn't. I'm going in the pit, okay? I'm going in the pit. I'm going in with the other artists. I'm going in with the environmental scientists. I'm going with David Attenborough. I'm going in with everyone. You know, I'm going in with the climate scientists. I'm going in with the researchers. I'm going in with the writers and the political analysts and the goddamn fucking minds, all right? I'm going in the pit. <laughs> and I don't know if it's too dark a way to end this show. I don't know if it's too grim to end on this note. But maybe, maybe when they begin, the executions, I don't know, is it too dark, is it too grim, is it too self-indulgent to say that, I don't know, like, it'd be nice to be in the first couple of rounds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't mind being behind Nish Kumar is what I'm saying, but I would like to be in front of Ricky Gervais, all right? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, I really appreciate it. <laughs>